Hey everyone, welcome back to Home with Olympus Thursday Night Live edition. I'm Michela, and this week we are kicking off part of our Astro April series, and we are going to have a special guest, Frank Smith, with us tonight. So I'd love to welcome him on to the show. Hey, Frank, how's it going? It's going great. Thanks, Michelle. I'm like looking forward to this evening. I am very excited. We have got a ton of people already on right now from all Excellent. over the world. Again, Italy, Washington, Edmonton, I'm Switzerland. Thank you guys all for joining us. It's super exciting to see where everyone comes from. That's so, fantastic. Frank, Frank is going to talk to us because it's Astro April, right? Frank, what are you going to share with us tonight? What's what's on your agenda? So we're going to talk about the magic of night skies. And uh, there's a lot of uh, content to this. I'm going to share some tips and tricks. And uh, hopefully it'll be fun and uh, educational at the same time. So that's the plan. Awesome. I'm really, really excited for this. Astro is some of my favorite stuff. And I'm very hopeful I'm going to learn a lot from you tonight, too. Uh, so everyone down there in the comment section, giving us all of your locations right now. Thank you so much for sharing and exercising your keyboard. Uh, we are going to be holding off on answering questions on this presentation until the end, but don't worry. We're going to go through. We'll find some of your questions, pop them up so that Frank can answer them for us. Also, our super, super awesome Olympus team is there answering some questions in the comments tonight. So anything we can help you with, we will try to get them answered as quickly as possible or over the coming weekend. Don't worry, we always try to get you those answers you're looking for. So without further ado, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to leave this to Frank and let him uh, share all of his knowledge with us tonight. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, allow me to pull up the screen here, if you will. Just bear with me one second. And we have this in place. Hold on one second. And if you'll bear with me, hopefully you can see the screen okay. And Michelle, if you could just tell me if we're good to go, I wanna make sure that uh, everybody is uh, able to see the screen. Frank, I lost your presentation. Can you share your, your, your presentation screen for me one more time? I will do my best if you'll bear with me. Absolutely. You know, technology, this live stuff is always fun. <laughs> well, we seem to be having a bit of a glitch here because when I go to share it, I do not see the uh, keynote part of this here. So uh, if you'll bear with me, let's try this again. And well, you, are you, you seeing anything now? Yeah, tr full screen your keynote for me. Uh-huh. All right, we got it. Look at that. All You're right. Back in business? Yes. Uh, can you hide the thing that says StreamYard is sharing your screen? Can you see I that? Sure can. Whoops. That didn't like that button. Are you still with me? <laughs> I'm still here. Yep, yep. I'm going to remove that for a sec. <laughs> go to, yeah, there we go. Let's go back to screen share here. And just right. right at the very bottom, it, yeah, there we are. Perfect. Are we back in business? We're back in business. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Technology is nobody's friend when you want it to be, and we're off. Let's all go, right. Frank. Thanks, Michelle. So thank you, everybody, for joining me. First of all, I appreciate the opportunity to be in all of your homes this evening. And uh, as I said earlier, I'm going to endeavor to make this entertaining. And uh, since many of you are in various parts of the world, I told Michelle early on that I was hoping that uh, this beautiful weather that we're having here in Pennsylvania wouldn't deter uh, those of you who are attending. So uh, I'm glad to know that we've got a good turnout. So my plan is to share with you my tips, tricks, and techniques uh, this evening as it relates to uh, night skies. And a bulk of this will be on the astro part of it, but also, spend a little time on just night skies in general, and I'll share some imagery towards the end. But my hope is to uh, give you these tips and tricks early on and uh, hopefully share some things that maybe uh, that you might have struggled with or that you weren't sure about, and then apply that at the end of this where I'm planning to share some of the images and some of the techniques that I've just discussed 
and uh, put some application to it from that standpoint. So without any further ado, let's jump into this. So my agenda is to uh, pretty much run through some of the, uh, the technical parts of things. We're going to talk about the various types of night skies and locations, timing considerations, which is a really important part, and uh, spend a little time on gear and camera settings and jump into some compositional parts of this. And then, as I said, we'll jump into the imagery aspect of this towards the end. But the one thing I did want to preface on this is this is kind of like a part one of two. And I'm very fortunate that my very dear friend and fellow visionary, uh, Peter Baumgarten, is going to be doing a follow-up. So I'm going to mention some things during the presentation that uh, uh, will be applicable to what he's going to be jumping into. So uh, this is uh, this is this would be great if you have the opportunity to join on, I guess, two weeks from today, I think is when that is. And uh, he'll be able to pick up on a few other pieces to this. So as far as types, stars obviously being the main uh, showstopper, if you will, here. We're going to talk a little bit about stationary stars. We'll jump into the trails and, of course, uh, look at some of the Milky Way options. But the other things that I want to chat with you a little bit about with the night skies is the Aurora Borealis, uh, also known as the uh, Northern Lights. We'll talk a little bit about some light painting and uh, throw in a few fireworks and some landscapes. And something that I spend a fair amount of my time in is in the architectural world and uh, how even with night skies in this arena, I've found this to be a really fun component of what I do. So locations. There's pretty much two locations that I identified, and I don't mean in as far as geography, but as far as types. So, of course, there's the rural aspect, and then there's also the urban aspect. And what I mean by this is that a lot of times people say, if I live in an urban area, there isn't an opportunity for night photography or star photography. I'm here to tell you that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, so we're going to chat a little bit about that as we get into this. So on the timing end of this, you know, some of the major considerations that, you know, need to take place is to tie it, just looking at the time of the year and winter, spring, summer, fall. For me, I don't let any of those of those deter me, but there are implications with some of those. And that's something you obviously need to be comfortable with. Uh, but it's one of those two where uh, there, there are some better times. And again, for Astro, that's pretty key. And that'll become a little more apparent as we get into this. So under the timing considerations, light pollution uh, is pretty important because as I said, even though we can do some stuff urban, if you wanna do where you have the best uh, uh, star pictures, you want to mitigate the uh, light pollution. And there are many resources uh, on, uh, you know, you can Google and find out where the best spots are. I live in this section here in the Lehigh Valley, which is just outside of some ma major metropolitan markets. To, slightly to the east, you can see New York City. To the south is New York. Further south is uh, Washington. And out to the uh, west is Pittsburgh. But in those areas, if you're looking to do a primary focus on astro, you want to avoid, of course, those if you have that option. But also close by is even though these metropolitan areas are nearby, there's also a lot of uh, dark sky options in and around the areas, no matter where you live. So I you know, would suggest that this is something that you check out if you're planning to do some of that. And there are many apps out here. This is one that uh, that I use as the LPM or light pollution map. And we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more as we get into it. But the other consideration for astrophotography and night photography, of course, is weather. And, uh, you know, some of it is going to be important where you have a no-go situation. But there are other times where, you know, I'm still going to pursue it. And one of those is clouds. And my rule of thumb is if it's if the cloud prediction coverage is 50% or less, I'm going to still do it. So I don't let those clouds deter me. And again, I'll start share some examples of that as we get into this, where it's actually worked, I think, to enhance some of the imagery. The other thing is if it's rain or snow, it's a no-go for me. In that case, there's no sense even trying to take a chance because the odds of that working are going to be probably slim to none. The other thing is heavy humidity. And that you know, there's there's different components to this. And if it's extremely heavy, there's going to be particles in the air. And if you're looking at finite stars and things of that nature, it will have an impact. Don't let that drive your decision in totality, but do know that there are some considerations that uh, you should be thinking about relative to that. 
Um, weather, uh, you know, I use a dark, I use dark sky as one of the uh, predictors for me, and I've found this to work very, very well. Uh, this gives me an hour by hour. It'll give me, uh, you know, a, a forecast out down the road, and it allows me to look at when precipitation or temperature changes are coming my way. So again, just from a planning standpoint, this is uh, obviously a very important tool for us if we're doing nighttime photography. Um, and let's talk about the moon. This happens to be the, uh, we had that super blood moon a couple years ago, and I did a sequence of these. The moon is probably one of the biggest considerations for me because this has a lot of impact on how I will plan or photograph any type of astro work. And more specifically, if there's an opportunity for us to have the new moon, which is completely uh, invisible, you're gonna have the darkest skies. But again, I don't let that totally stop me because in many respects, I like a little bit of light in some of my foreground elements and so forth. So a crescent moon actually can work to your benefit also. Again, particularly if you have some uh, other elements in the composition that are important. And again, rule of thumb there is if the, if the uh, light or the portion of the moon doesn't exceed 25%, then that's still a pretty good dark sky to work with. Um, and looking at this month, you know, when is the ideal time if you were trying to follow that pattern? And as you can see here, we are in the middle of the perfect time of the year for astrophotography. And you can see from uh, the 6th, which was a couple days ago, up to the 17th, right dead center, we're in the peak of this as it relates to a dark sky. And if you really wanted that perfect total dark uh, on Sunday, get your camera gear ready because that's where it's going to be at its darkest point again at this part of the world so again one of those look at the you want to look at the uh, maps to determine when that's most appropriate for you but having said that i don't let a full moon or a near full moon necessarily stop me from photographing this is an image i shot in the atacama desert in south america and uh we were delivered a beautiful sky but the moon was out and as you can see over my shoulder it's illuminating these uh, stone features that you see here. And so you just have to be sensitive to the direction in which you're gonna be shooting and you can still capture some beautiful astrophotography. So don't let that necessarily deter you. And the same applies for other celestial, uh, you know, things that uh, you may be considering shooting. And then the other piece that many of us like to photograph, of course, is the Milky Way. And in this area, I use uh, an app called the Dark Sight Finder. And the season typically is March to September, uh, but you know the, some of the real peak to that is maybe more refined to April and August. And all the things that I mentioned before relative to the moon positioning, weather and so forth, obviously still apply if you have the perfect time frame for a Milky Way, but it's, uh, it's raining, obviously that's not gonna work for you. So a good app to blend with some of the other considerations in your planning. So let's take a minute and just talk about gear. Uh, and this is an area where, you know, I would tell you that to have a uh, reasonably good, a reasonably good camera is going to be to your benefit, uh, whether it be a mirrorless DSLR, uh, point and shoe. I use that, uh, you see in the middle there, that TG6. That's a great little camera. I've actually done some Astro where they work with that. And, you know, there's some film photographers out there too. So with that, uh, again, I, I would emphasize that it's good to have a camera that's particularly good with uh, uh, noise and some other things. But my go-to camera is the uh, OMD EM1 Mark III. And I'll share with you a little later why this is such an important tool for me in my photography. So the second most important part from my standpoint is the lenses. And uh, as you can see here, I noted that faster is better to a certain extent. Uh, I think the sweet spot is around a 2.8, uh, and there are faster lenses, uh, but sometimes you run into challenges with depth of field. If you start going down to a 1.4, 1.2, or even a 0.95, uh, you have no room for error on that. So again, for me, I find the 2.8 to be a, a good sweet spot. Focal lengths, uh, Micro Four Thirds 7 to 14, and full frame equivalent would be 14 to 28. 
for me, those are pretty much ideal, uh, uh, you know, focal lengths for the bulk of the astral work that I do. And again, you'll see some of those images in just a little bit. So then there's the question about prime versus zoom and what's the pros, what's the cons. And I will tell you that typically a prime usually is a faster lens. However, then you're limited to, you know, which, what your options are. If you need to adjust, uh, you know, into a particular image, you're limited that you end up having to move as opposed to the lens. My go-to lens uh, for astrophotography is the 7 to 14 2.8. But second to that, uh, the fisheye is, uh, as I understand it, the fastest fisheye in the world at 1.8, uh, which is a really, really wonderful lens for that. But the other one that I use a fair amount too is the 12 millimeter uh, 1.20 uh, on this or 2.0 on this. And that's a real, really nice lens. The other two lenses you see up there on the right, that's the 17 millimeter uh, 1.2, super fast, but just not quite wide enough for me for most cases, but I do use it periodically. And in the lower left is the uh, 12 to 40, which is a 2.8. But again, I like a little bit wider for my, uh, my work. So on the gear side of this, uh, you know, probably goes without saying, you know, uh, you need a sturdy tripod and because too many times I've seen people where, you know, that they get a little bit of wind and you get some shake in there, a cable release or a smartphone connection. I'm shooting more and more of my images using the smartphone paired with the camera, which is a really nice tool because I even have more control and not have to worry about touching the camera at all. And as you're doing astro and night photography, batteries can go fast. So bring extra ones, bring extra light uh, memory cards and a headlamp. And I will tell you, make sure it has the red uh, option available on it because I've seen a lot of images get ruined because somebody accidentally hits their light on their headlamp and then it uh, can have a negative impact. And of course, appropriate clothing and footwear, depending upon where you are in the world. So camera settings. And this is what works for me. And again, you may, it may have a couple of different twists that work for you, but I would encourage you to put it in that uh, manual mode. Uh, you can see that I do note that app, it can work in aperture priority, but again, I like the flexibility of being able to kind of move on the fly with modifications. And so the manual mode for me is a, is a really important way to set up. And same thing with respect to focus. Uh, uh, it's too difficult, particularly if you're photographing at night, to use, uh, you know, the camera's uh, uh, focal points or focus points, if you will. So this is something that we'll talk about a little bit more in detail in just a minute. And the sweet spot, as I mentioned, for me on the aperture is 2.8. Uh, again, it gives me a little bit of flexibility on the depth of field side of it. So if I'm not 100% on target, it's probably not going to be the end of the day. I still have a little bit of latitude with it. And then on the speed of the shutter speed, uh, my general rule of thumb is not to exceed 20 to 25 seconds. Now, the wider you go and the further with your focal length, that has other implications. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, the, the uh, you know the rule of thumb here, or the 500 rule that uh, seems to get the most notoriety, is basically taking 500 and dividing it by the full length equivalent of your lens and by way of example, on the right-hand side, uh, if you were shooting uh, a 16 millimeter or a uh, eight millimeter micro four thirds, you could actually go 31, 32 seconds uh, thereabout and not get a whole lot of star trails. And that is arguable and debatable. Uh, there is a couple other rules out there, the 600 rule, which is the same thing that uh, uh, applies, but you're dividing it uh, with a different number. There's also a 400 rule, and I think Peter's going to talk a little bit about that. And then there's the NPF rule. And this is probably one of the best, but if you look at the definition on the right, it is complicated uh, to the point where I'm not even sure how I would do that. But there are apps that have this for you that you can simply type it in and it'll give you a quick answer. But to do it manually, I don't know that I would take the time to do that. So talking about the settings then, 
where's my ISO? And most of the time, particularly if it's a dark environment, I'm in that 3,200 to 6,400 mark on my camera. And uh, again, using that 2.8, that seems to be a number, a set of numbers that work reasonably well in tandem with, of course, the shutter speeds that I mentioned. So on the white balance, um, during the day, I have my white balance set for uh, auto. The only exception to that is when I'm shooting it at night. And of course, I'm making the assumption that we're shooting raw on this. And the reason I would encourage you to pick a number, because if you're doing a bunch of uh, editing and post, if you're uh, if it's reading with different settings, you're going to be challenged because you're going to have different effects. Uh, even though it's in RAW, you can still modify it back. You don't want to have a whole bunch of different settings. So I'd encourage you to maybe pick one. And for me, I work in that 35 to 3900 range. I know there are other photographers that like them a little warmer. Of course, it's a personal choice of yours, but I would suggest picking one and then staying with that during the rest of your evening shoot. Here's another uh, question that I get asked a fair amount. Well, what about the in-camera noise reduction? And there's pros and cons to this. The, the pros are that in many cases, it does a reasonably good job. The con is that it takes twice as long to process. And what I mean by that, if I'm doing a 30 second exposure, if I have the noise reduction on, I have to wait an additional 30 seconds before I can take a picture because it's processing it using doing that uh, noise reduction. So if you're in a situation where your intention is to get, you know, multiple uh, shots in during the evening, you may want to turn that off. But the only thing is then you need to be prepared to do a, a little more work in post-production with some noise reduction. But and it, you know, I don't get hung up too much on that, but again, depending upon your timing and the amount of shots you get, that'll probably weigh your decision. I, I'd lean more towards turning it off. So I mentioned earlier about the uh, RAW versus JPEG, and in my mind, if you have the choice and you're comfortable with it, you wanna absolutely use RAW. But having said that, if you're a JPEG shooter only, I would hate for you to miss many of the opportunities out there. Of course, you can do that. But given the choice, I'm going to shoot raw because there's so much more latitude in, in as far as your post processing is processing is concerned. So let's talk about some camera settings beyond the stationary stars. What if we're going to do Aurora Borealis? And what about settings for that? And in this case, I will tell you that most of the settings that I shared with you are probably similar, except on the shutter speed. And one of the things that I love about the Rory Borealis is that they dance. And if you're photographing, I would tell you, please take a moment and watch these things dance. And it's amazing to see. But when they're dancing, that means they're moving. And I don't like to go much beyond six seconds, four to eight in that range, uh, unless you happen to have a very, very still uh, you know, scenario. But most of the time they're moving, so you don't want to go too much more than that. And the good news is, is they're brighter. So as such, you have the ability to not have to worry about needing as much light on it. And in these cases, a lot of times my ISO is in that 1000 to 3200 range. And you can see in the picture on the right that I'm at 2500 with this one uh, at uh, six seconds. And this has worked out very well. And we'll, I'll show you an edit on this in a little bit. And then the other question is, what about star trails? And in this case, again, similar settings, uh, shutter piece speeds are going to be affected. If you're not using this in live composite, which I do most of mine in, you may have to use an intervalometer and you're going to take multiple shots and combine them in post. That's a whole other conversation. But again, it's still an option if, uh, if you don't have the live composite. So speaking of live composite, let's assume that we're going to go that route how do we get to it? And I'm using the uh, EM1 Mark III in this example, and on the Mark II and some of the other cameras, there's a, they're slightly different than some of those are in the manual mode, but on this one, go to B and just simply dial in uh, to live composite. And from here, uh, there are settings in E2 that uh, I would suggest you go to and tee this up. My 
uh, astro work is anywhere between five and 20 seconds is what my normal go-to settings are. But it's one of those where I tell people also, just take a couple short bursts and double check to see how it's looking, make sure that everything's right, and then you can ultimately decide if you need to make any modifications. And then once you have done that, it says press the shutter once to prepare for composite shooting, and this will create your base layer, and you'll basically see a blank screen at this process. And then the next step is it says ready for composite shooting. So at this point, on the technical side, you're ready to roll and shoot, uh, you know, whether it be star trails or single stars, but this is a key to that setup. And using live composite, this is an example where I set the camera up. This happens to be uh, some in the old Bethel steel plant near where I live. I uh, got the, uh, everything set up and I had asked the one fellow to walk through and he was kind enough to paint Olympus, which by the way, when you're doing this backwards and you have to do it backwards is a bit challenging, but I'm watching on the back of my screen, this being spelled out. And when he's done, I just hit the shutter release and it stops. And that's the beauty of this. And it obviously gives you a, a raw image to work with, which is really nice to have. So we're ready to shoot. And I would say, just not yet. So if I could just point out a couple things more before you do this, because one of the temptations that we have is a lot of people will get these beautiful shots of the, uh, of the stars, but composition is still paramount. And what I would encourage all of you to be thinking about is looking at incorporating other elements into your star shots, you know, foreground, background, you know, what's around the perimeter. So again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the other thing is your focus points. And this is one of those where I struggled with this over the years too, is where do we focus at when you wanna photograph these things? And we'll talk a little bit about that. But once you've determined that, then you're ready to watch the magic happen. And we'll jump into this in just a little bit. So on the composition start of it, this is an example of a live composite uh, that has some star photography, some landscape mixed into it. But I'm always looking for the compositional part of it. You see those light posts on the left? I use that as my left frame. And of course, the ones on the right, I'm using that as my right frame. And I want my horizontals to be accurate. And I still wanted to make sure I got that star in the picture. So the question about also determining what's the primary subject in this? Well, for me, it was the signage that you see in the foreground because I wanted that to be my absolute sharpest element but I also wanted that star in the background that happens to be on top of the mountain in the back there to be an important element. So the other thing with respect to composition is I also find the imagery to be more pleasing if you can create layers. And in here I have a foreground, I've got a mid ground, and then I also have a background. And that applies to almost any type of photography, at least from my vantage point that I always try to incorporate into. The next piece to this is uh, planning for uh, blending, uh, adding natural light, adding artificial light. And uh, in this case, I'm not going to spend much time on this because I believe uh, when Peter and I talk, this is something he's going to chat with you a little bit more when his presentation comes up. Most of what I'm sharing uh, with you today are single shots without the blending, but there are definite benefits that you'll find uh, with doing that. And the other thing, as I mentioned, is determining the focus points. And then also consider adding the human element periodically into your image. So let's then go on to the question about where do you focus your lens? And in this example, you can see the camera is showing the beautiful Milky Way in the center of those two uh, stone pillars. And for me, if I were photographing this, I would put my focus point on one of those pillars. It's far enough away that everything in the back would be in focus. And if you had the choice, you could go to this location during the day, and a lot of times we don't have this opportunity, is set your camera, mark it with some tape on your lens, and you know exactly where this needs to be. Now, for many of us, and me included, we don't necessarily have the luxury or the option to get to a location beforehand. And if such, if that's the case, then we have some different criteria that we have to deal with. And one of those, again, depending upon the distance, is I could use a flashlight and put it on something and try and focus. But in order to do any of that successfully, the live view is by far and away the best option 
to get the focus right. And there's some tools that we have that we can help to accomplish that. And one of those is focus peaking. And on this one, you can go into your menu and D3, as you can see on the screen here, is where focus peaking is. I set mine up and for me, I happen to find best luck for yellow. I think the default is red. Your choice, of course, which, whichever you like. But for me, focus peaking adds an additional element of uh, securing good focus on it. It's, that, uh, it's a real tool that I find to be very helpful. And then the other piece to it is we have something called manual focus assist. And this is in the uh, gear A4 part of the menu. And what you do is you simply click on that and there are a couple options, uh, magnifying, peaking. What you want to do in both cases is turn those on. And what happens when you do that and you move your focus ring when you are in manual focus, it automatically zooms in and it automatically turns on focus peaking. And it allows you the preciseness sometimes necessary in order to focus on your subject. Here's an example. This happens to be... Um, an insect, but the concept and the theory is still the same, where once you move the focus ring, uh, in this case, the red color was turned on, you can see the uh, where the focus points are, and once you have it where you know you want it to be, you've nailed it, then no longer touch the lens, and you're ready to go then. So a little bit of a bonus for those of us that have the OMD EM1 Mark III, I mentioned earlier why this is my go-to camera, and I want to share with you why that is the case. We have a setting called Starry Sky AF, which to me is absolutely magic. And to set this, all you do is you go up to the focus portion of your super uh, menu here, and where it says SAF or where you know the rest of the focus modes are, what you would do is dial it all the way to the right where you see that star and then the words AF and this is all in the super control panel and then you're set and this is where the magic really starts to happen. At this point, all you do is click, of course, having your composition set up, you click the AEL, AFL button and what this is going to do is go to work and it's going to run and say starry sky is running and as soon as that stops, it's absolutely amazing. I don't have any idea how it does it. It locks on and you have a crystal sharp image uh, of the stars that uh, are just, it's just absolutely amazing how this works. This for me is one of the biggest time savers in doing astrophotography. So again, if you have the uh, EM1 Mark III, I encourage you to uh, use that setting. So a couple apps that I use for planning and these are some really, really important tools. Uh, Photopills, uh, the Photographers of Fairness, those are two that I use a lot. There are a whole host of tools that are in these software programs. And again, we could spend an hour just picking one of these and going through all the nuances of them. Uh, obviously, we don't have the time to do that. Uh, that I have found, again, to be very, very helpful. And the uh, one that you see noted there is Starwalk. This is probably the one though they use the most and I think it gets the least amount of t attention. And the reason being is when I'm out in the field and I'm looking for Polaris, the, you know, the, uh, the star that I'm going to use for my star trails to get my center point, I just hold the thing up. I'll type in the word Polaris and I just move myself around and it'll pinpoint exactly. So I now have a general idea where it is. I can refine that by using some of the other programs. But for me, it's a really quick way to determine, uh, you know, where that's going to be. And so I can set my composition based around that. Uh, Aurora, that's, of course, for the forecasting of Aurora Borealis. And Google Earth is, again, for me, invaluable because I want to see if I might pick this, the right location based on some of these other programs. But it turns out there's a mountain or a sign or something in front of me. I want to know that in advance as best as I can. So a couple other apps that, uh, you know, we talked a couple, about a couple of these before. The Dark uh, Sight Finder is, is a really uh, helpful tool for Milky Way and also light pollution. And, of course, the light pollution map that I mentioned early on. 
And on the weather side of it, uh, I use uh, Dark Sky, as I mentioned. I find that one to be the most successful for me. There's also one called Clear Outside that's got a fair amount of uh, good reviews, but I believe it's Android only, and I uh, and I do use a, an iPhone, so I can't uh, use that. So anyway, a couple apps that I hope would uh, help you. And then the part you know where you know we bring these images back. What am I using to process the post process these images? And in many other examples besides just astro and night photography. Lightroom is my first start point. I use the Lightroom Classic, and for me, this becomes the base and also, uh, you know, where I get a lot of my global settings that work well for me. Subsequent to that, then I may take it into Photoshop, and again, most of the time when I'm doing Astro, I do, and you'll see why in a minute, because I do use some plugins. And for some of you that don't use Lightroom, Adobe Camera Raw is now part of that and it pretty much is the same process that uh, Lightroom uh, has in its uh, you know bag of tricks if you will but there's a couple plugins that I have found to be very helpful outside of the Adobe platform that I use a fair amount and the first one is the Topaz Denoise so when you're doing astro and night photography it's going to be inevitable you're going to have some noise that you need to deal with and I have found this program is one for me that works pretty well. And once I've gone through that and done all of my other settings, I'll oftentimes also use the Nick software program and uh, take it into there to work on a little bit more of the contrast and a few other tools that they have. But that's my setup for night photography and astrophotography as it relates to software. So with regard to processing it, I just share this quickly. The image you see in the upper right is one of the images I shared with you before. That's the raw image right out of the camera. And I shoot raw because again, as I mentioned, I have the most latitude. So I take it in the Lightroom and I get it to a point where I'm pretty happy that I've gotten most of the contrast, the vibrance, uh, you know, the light levels and so forth. And then that last step, as I mentioned, is where I take it into uh, Lightroom with the various plugins. And then this is the final result. And as you can see, I've got tack sharp crystal, uh, stars. I've got the Aurora Borealis. It's all a splendor. I'm not uh, you know, blowing out any highlights or even shadows to a cer certain extent. So again, from the uh, post-processing standpoint, this work this workflow works reasonably well for me. So let's take a look at some of the images at this point. And as I said, I broke these down into a few categories. And let's talk about the architectural since this is a portion that I do on a frequent basis where I introduce uh, nighttime photography when I'm doing some of that work. Uh, this is uh, in Philly. Uh, I wanted the star trails you see in the foreground and yet the stars, I wanted those to come through. And again, many opportunities in areas like that. Uh, here I am in uh, New York City. Uh, this is uh, the Manhattan Bridge you see in the foreground with the Brooklyn Bridge in the background. And the reason I share this with you is it's very rare to see it like this because where's the uh, New York City skyline? It doesn't exist. Well, what has happened is I hit this on a night when the fog was so intense. And at first thought is, oh, no, I just, you know, I'm going to lose any opportunity tonight to get this shot when it actually turned out to be pretty cool because it's not many times when you can photograph uh, this part of New York and not see the skyline. So it's kind of a unique perspective in that regard. And here's the Brooklyn Bridge in the foreground. Of course, I'm doing this in total darkness. You can see the fog. You can see some of the buildings in the background. Uh, so uh, again, even if you have a foggy night, don't let that deter you. And this is, you know, if any of you have seen any of my architectural presentations, I use this as a talking point. This is uh, Philadelphia from the Spring Garden Street Bridge. Uh, I shot this, of course, in the winter. You can see in the foreground the ice that's there. On the right is the... Uh, Sierra Center on the left is the Comcast Center. And I mentioned those buildings just to keep that in mind. And this was just as the sun went down and the bizarre colors you see are exactly what was there. It was just one of those magic evenings. So I waited five minutes, moved myself 30 feet to the right. And here's the image I had uh, over the Schuylkill Expressway where the other shot was over the Schuylkill River. And you'll see the Sierra Center on the right and the Comcast Center on the left. Uh, and I moved all of 30 feet away and waited all of five minutes, and yet the image totally changed. 
there's no more detail in the sky anymore because it's being that dark. So I can pack my bags and I'll leave. Well, let's wait five more minutes and go 30 feet back to where we started. And again, from a long exposure to a live composite, now I've got star trails. What are those things you see over on the right-hand side? Those are the helicopters waiting to land at a couple of the hospitals that are uh, right over in that part of Philadelphia. But again, you'll notice the Sierra Center on the right, Comcast Center on the left. So all three of these images taken within 15 minutes apart of each other with totally different types of results just by waiting a few minutes. So the message there is don't necessarily assume you're done. You may have some additional opportunities. Uh, this is the museum right to not too far from there. And I said about shooting in urban centers, you'll see the stars that are up there. You can still do that. Of course, you have to have the right sky in order to accomplish that. Um, and this is uh, back in New York, uh, uh, a favorite place of mine to photograph. This is in uh, Brooklyn on the Dumbo side. Uh, just as the sky was ready to go completely dark, that you could see by the lights in the building, a long exposure uh, with some beautiful blue sky and uh, some clouds there. This is in Cleveland, a uh, workshop I did there just before COVID, uh, really lovely part of uh, Cleveland, you know, with the water reflections, but look at the sky. Again, it's a dark sky and we have clouds, but we're able to see details because of the light that the city is creating. And at the same location, this is uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, using that chain as a leading line into the image. And again, when I'm doing my uh, some of my professional work with the architectural work, uh, you know, I'm always taking and trying different shots utilizing uh, nighttime. And the last one in this uh, arena here is the Brooklyn Bridge. And this has got a little bit of all the elements. I've got the uh, architectural components in the background. I've got stars, I've got clouds, I've got a plane going through the image and I've got taillights and headlights all in the same image. And again, I'm using live composite, and this is probably about, you know, uh, three to five minute exposure. I don't recall offhand. So landscapes, uh, again, even if there aren't stars, in this case, uh, this is in Lofoten, uh, Norway, um, the, the mountain is being lit by uh, man-made light. And the softness that you see behind the mountain is that there's a big storm that's approaching. Five minutes after I took this, you couldn't see five feet in front of your hand. And here's one where I was setting up to do a uh, landscape shot with some star trails. And when I first got here, I was, oh no, there's some kids playing in the water. And if you see that the young fella in the foreground, I thought, I hope they're not gonna mess up my picture. Well, it turned out that that was one of my favorite pictures. This is just prior to sunset, just prior to me getting ready to photograph star trails. But look at the clouds. I'm thinking, wait a minute, there's only supposed to be so many and I checked the weather and it said, you know, less than 50% cloud coverage. And what happened then is I waited a couple of minutes and then uh, here's my first shot that I took using star trails. And I'm sharing this with you because this is an example of what you don't want. Uh, when I was photographing at this lake, uh, there was uh, apparently a parking lot or something on the other side and somebody wants to turn their car on, um, you know, a lot of problems with the image and it, just didn't wait, but I know now to have patience. And so I waited a little bit longer and it got darker. There were no more cars to be had. And uh, this is probably about an hour exposure. And I was very happy. But again, here is the first thing I did is I went to locate that uh, North Star or Polaris that you see there because I need to make that an important part of my, uh, of my composition. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in fireworks. Uh, I, I, you know, I've done these with long exposures. I've done these with live composite. Uh, I have found that the most luck that I have with doing fireworks is using live composite because I can see right on the back of my screen when it's done, when I'm happy with where it is, and I know exactly when to turn the, uh, the shutter off. And uh, for me, this is a great opportunity. I happen to be on the roof of a building uh, that I was given permission to be on in order to get some of this on the uh, 4th of July. This was a couple of years ago. So light painting. Again, when I'm doing light painting, you have the option of using long exposure. But for me, I find the live composite works the best because I'm never going to get overblown highlights and I can have white light sources walk through. This is a, a local artist who does some amazing work and has given me permission to be on his property for uh, 
uh, workshops periodically. Here's a selfie. This isn't really light painting. Me spinning some steel wool, waiting for the security guard to go by. I timed it. Uh, don't tell anybody where I knew it. it. Took him seven minutes to go around. So I figure if I got that shot before he made his next stop, I'd be able to get the shot before I'd be uh, asked to leave. So I didn't say that, did I? I guess I did. Anyway, uh, light painting is fun. And again, in these cases, I had a light wand. Uh, and if you look, you'll see there's stars in the sky. And if you look closely, there's no highlight blowouts in any of these areas of this image. And again, that's the beauty of being able to utilize live composite for things like light painting. And again, just having somebody walk through is just great fun, uh, you know, when you're doing things like this. And here's an example of a picture where I tell people that I almost hit the delete key on this because, you know, again, I asked somebody to walk through with a light wand and I felt reasonably good about it. But, you know, it's like, nah, it didn't work. And then I looked at it closely and I noticed there's two angels kissing in this picture. I cropped the other out. And now I have a picture of two angels that uh, were light painted without, of course, being planned that way. And to think I almost deleted this image. So let's talk about the Aurora Borealis. Uh, again, great fun. Uh, I believe this was in Iceland and uh, love watching them dance. And as I said, these are probably on average six seconds, anywhere between that four and eight, depending upon the conditions and the brightness of the Aurora Borealis. Um, and uh, an important element from a compositional standpoint is I try to get foreground elements and it almost looks like the, uh, uh, like a, a green volcano in some respects is what somebody told me. But of course, that's just the, uh, the magnetic fields there. But look at the stars you see through the Aurora Borealis and also, you know, on either side. So of course you want to avoid star trails if that's your intention when you're photographing these. And so the shorter time frame actually works to your benefit. And here's an, this is a, this is in Norway. And uh, I looked for foreground element that would be reflective. And so if you have that choice, uh, of course, this time of the year, it was a frozen pond and uh, I purposely knew that if I could find something like that, that I could put in my foreground element, I'd get some reflection off of the uh, water. And uh, again, different types of setups with that, but you still see the stars, you still see the Aurora Borealis, and of course, then the reflection, just to help uh, create a little more interest in the composition. So the last segment of images that I wanna share with you is what I think is the main star of the show is the stars themselves. And I mentioned early on about the Atacama Desert in South America. It's the uh, largest arid desert in the world, but one of the most inhospitable places to get to. And it goes below freezing every night and above 100 during the day. Really challenging area. But for me, one of the most magical places on this earth. Very few human beings get to the center core. I was very fortunate to be able to have that arranged. So when I was photographing this, as I mentioned earlier, I've got the moon shining obviously pretty bright because people are looking at this and saying, you know, well, what, what did you do to light it? And this is a Mother Nature lit image. And uh, you see the bright star in the kind of left-hand side. I tried to purposely position that opening in that uh, rock feature there to kind of align with that. So a lot of times when I'm doing my composition, I'm being cognizant of that and looking for those types of opportunities. And here's that image that I showed you earlier, but in the full, uh, view of this and you can see on the left hand side how that bright that uh, one rock is and this is all lit by the moon you can see the shadows from it uh, it was that bright but yet i still have uh, pretty good stars in the uh, background here's the milky way this is a different night in the atacama desert and the question that begs to be asked is what's lighting the uh, mountain that you see there so we had uh, two jeeps with us they're jeep type vehicles because you have to have these incredibly large wheels because this is all sand inevitably one gets stuck you need another one to pull out but we had him go over and we had uh, walkie talkies with us and we said uh, at a certain point we got set up and said turn the lights on just for a second and turn them right back off and that's uh, the man-made light that you see on the uh, left hand side of that mountain that uh, just before the uh, milky way there uh, this is in tennessee uh, just a a beautiful wood cabin uh, set this up uh, this is probably about a two-hour exposure uh, 
this would not work if I had a night where the wind was moving. It was a very, very still night, and otherwise those tree limbs would have uh, been totally blurred out. But because it was such a still night, I was able to capture the trails that you see them. Uh, this is in Mongolia. I'm in the westernmost part of Mongolia, a very, very barren area, and that foreground element is was my home for a couple nights. They call them girts there. And what I did in this shot is uh, I went outside, identified where the uh, Polaris would be, and this is a three-hour exposure. I set my camera up on a tripod, uh, flashed my light briefly on the girt to give it uh, some detail. I went back inside, went to sleep. Three hours later, I woke up, turned the shutter off, came back out, and this was the result of that uh, three-hour endeavor. And we can now shoot up to six hours uh, with this, but uh, this is a three hour shot. And then on the other side, also in Mongolia, this was the guide, he was in a tent and uh, I knew the Milky Way was gonna be pretty prominent. And what I did here is I asked, could I put a small candle inside his tent mm -hmm. to give the tent a little bit of definition and uh, the two most brilliant places for stars that I've ever seen are this location here in Mongolia. There's nothing man-made for hundreds of miles that I could see, and it's just one of the purest skies I've ever seen. And of course, the other area is the Atacama Desert. But uh, again, uh, I'm pretty much in the same location where I took the girt. One was on one side, and the other, you know, of course, on this side here, I was able to capture that in the same location. So moving out to the western part of the world, this is a, a double arch, and uh, the question that begs to be asked here: What's uh, what's causing that? Cause casting that light on the uh, on the rocks, and since it is at least a twenty to twenty five second exposure, I have a small LED light about the size of a quarter uh, that you can't really even see with the human eye. You can detect it a little bit, but our cameras can pick up that light. And as such, it added that extra dimension. But this isn't what I was ultimately after. What I was ultimately after is I wanted the star trails. And so here is the exact same position. Uh, this is about a one hour exposure uh, with the uh, uh, star trails, you know, gleaming through those openings. And a trip out to this part of the world wouldn't be complete without a shot of delicate arch. And uh, for those of the United States, uh, no, um, the Utah license plate. This is on every license plate that you see there. Um, and you'll notice in the background that there's clouds, but again, it falls under that uh, rule where I said 50% or less. And I actually think the clouds helped make the image. I put that same LED at the base of this. This is about one o'clock in the morning, just myself and another fellow. That was all that was here. It was absolutely amazing. It was a beautiful evening. And to think it was just the two of us out there, uh, but again, this isn't what my ultimate objective was. So keeping the tripod in the exact same position and then setting it up an hour and 10 minutes later, this is the shot that I got. Again, one of my favorite images and uh, same location, uh, gone from 20 to 25 seconds to an hour and 10 minutes. And this is the final result from that. So let me wrap up by sharing an image. Uh, this was uh, right after the OMDEM uh, 1 Mark III came out and there was a group of us uh, uh, visionaries that were together and they said, go out and get some star shots with this. And, and we said, let's give it a go. And I was immediately blown away at the results of this. And this was uh, Ken using that technology. And the stars, if you could zoom in on this, are just absolutely brilliant and amazing. And again, us as photographers, it just makes it so much easier to know that you have the ability to get an immediate uh, sharp focus on that. But I also mentioned early on about the composition. If you have a chance to put somebody in and you'll see that window that you see there. And by the way, we just put a small light inside the uh, that old abandoned building there. And if you look closely, you'll see uh, my buddy Peter sitting in the window there, but he's a little more prominent uh, on this shot here. Of course, this is a much uh, shorter exposure, and hopefully that's a good segue into uh, the fact that he will be presenting in a couple of weeks. And with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.
very much. I appreciate the time. And Mishala, I am glad to turn this back over to you and endeavor to answer questions as I can. Awesome. We are excited. Thank you so much. I'm going to remove your slideshow out of there for now. Okay. Um, we can take a couple questions. We've got some time. That was a great presentation. Um, I'm very jazzed up. Just as a reminder to everybody, if you learned something tonight, we've got a new moon coming up this weekend. I think it's Sunday night. I think it's April 11th. Sunday so, night at 1030. That's when, if you're in this part of the country, that's exactly the time slot. So you don't want to miss that. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm very excited. I've like got it marked on my calendar and I'm hoping that I can use some of these techniques. <laughs> um, so I'm going to pop up a couple of questions. I see one from Linda and uh, there were a couple of questions about how you pick your exposure time. So maybe if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. Well, so if I'm doing something that's intricate and I'll use the example, I do a lot of daytime live composite where I put on a, uh, you know, 10 stop ND filter and I want to create that beautiful painterly effect and I want the, uh, you know, the shutter to go off frequently between shots. That's where I'll use that. But when I'm doing stars and star trails in particular, since they're so far away, uh, I have found that, you know, the probably the real sweet spot is right around 15 seconds. So the images that you saw, the delicate arch and the, uh, and the double arch there, those were all at 15, I think 15 or 18 seconds. So that's kind of the short version of, you know, at least the process that I use. Awesome. Awesome. I'm seeing a lot of thank you, Franks, in here. Uh, lots and lots of thank you, Franks. <laughs> if anyone wants to add any more questions in, related, in relation to the presentation, we'll be happy to answer them. Thankfully, you went through quite a bit in this presentation. I saw a couple of questions pop up that you pretty much immediately answered on your next slide. So that always works out great. Uh, but a lots and lots of thank yous. And we're really thankful to you guys for spending your evening with us. I know that in some parts of the world, it's very sunny tonight. Um, so I do see one comment asking, it hasn't quite popped up here yet, but it is over on this screen. <laughs> and they're asking if you ever use star stacking at all. So it's interesting. There's a lot of people that do that. I do not. And Peter does. And he said that he's going to incorporate that into his presentation. Uh, and he's going to talk a little bit about that. So um, I've touched on it a few times, but in, in many respects, sometimes it's, it, you know, there are other factors that weigh into it. And depending if I'm in some unique parts of the world, one, I don't necessarily have all the time necessary. And two, there's some additional equipment associated with it. So, uh, that's a limiting factor to a certain extent, but it's it's absolutely a brilliant technology and one that if you're so inclined, you should definitely give that a try. Awesome. And we got one other one here. What is your most used lens for star trails and Milky Ways? What's your favorite lens, Frank? Without any hesitation, I can say it's the seven to 14, the F 2.8. It is, you know, I'm a wide angle guy. It's, I love wide angle photography. And that is my my go to lens. So without any hesitation, I can answer that with that uh, with that lens. I love that. All right, I've got another one right here. I, I saw this come up a few different times, and maybe you can elaborate on how you shoot. But what is your best metering mode for stars? How do you like to meter in the night sky? So it's interesting because the the impact at night with stars it's not as tricky as, and, and it's, and it's not as decisive either. So I'm either a spot meter or center meter. And that's probably true with a lot of my other photography too. And I typically just will leave it for the most part in the center meeting meter. But then the beauty of shooting manually is after a shot, and I strongly advocate doing test shots, looking at the image and deciding, you know, I'm probably a little overexposed or maybe a little underexposed and adjusting accordingly. So uh, that's the one thing with star photography. It's not as exact as it might be for a typical daytime shot. So uh, allow yourself that flexibility, either bracket down or just adjust your shutter speed uh, to compensate for that. But again, as a start point, I'm in the I'm typically using center mo center for majority of what I do. Awesome. 
Okay, all the questions are rolling in now. Thanks, everybody. It got really overwhelming, and I have to keep up with all of you guys. <laughs> you guys type too fast. <laughs> so uh, this one is a good one because I know that we talk a lot about keeping the foreground in your images. Um, how do you manually focus so your foreground and stars both look nice and sharp? Well, it, that's a great question, and this is one of those where it is a little bit challenging. So the the to answer the question, I almost need to know how close is the foreground. And what I mean by that, sometimes foreground can be 100 feet away, 200 feet away, particularly if it's large landscapes. And in those cases, if it's something that's a couple hundred feet away, I'm going to pick a point there, focus on that, and my stars will be sharp, particularly if I'm shooting at f2.8 because I have that much additional flexibility with my depth of field. Now, the one thing, and again, it, this is something Peter's going to talk more on his presentation. I do stacking periodically with astrophotography from a focal point standpoint, where if I have a flower, as an example, that I'm shooting a wide angle and it's, uh, you know, 12 inches away, well, you're going to be real challenged to get one shot that will get everything in focus. And in that case, then what I will do is I'll do some focus stacking uh, or focus bracketing in the camera and then focus stack it in post so that I've got the benefit of both of those situations. So to answer that question, it, I do need to know a little bit more about where it positions itself. But I think if you get the idea that uh, if it's super close, uh, you pretty much are going to have to do some stacking with it. Whereas if the foreground elements are a couple hundred feet away, then it's less of an issue. You can, you can utilize one image to do that. Awesome. All right, I got another one for you. What do you think is the highest Bortle number where you can possibly capture the Milky Way? We, I know our East Coast people have a hard time sometimes because there's, there's not a lot of dark sights <laughs> on that side of the country. Well, it's interesting. I don't let that affect me. And the reason being is a lot of times if I'm in a location and I know I'm, I'm planning to be there, it doesn't make any difference. I'm going to figure out a way to try to make it work for the best case that I can in the environment that I'm at. And, you know, in the case of uh, Mongolia or the Atacama Desert in South America, I've got dark and I don't have to worry about anything there. But if I'm going to do a half an hour drive from my home here, I'm not going to have, uh, you know, the best light conditions. And what I'm going to do is just work the best that I can to mitigate, you know, any of those other peripherals to it. So I let the environment decide how I'm going to adjust for it as opposed to trying to, you know, you know, make it happen some other way. You know, I, I, I don't have, if I, if I'm going to be in South America on June 15th, I'm not going to say, well, you know what, I really need to go back there the following month because it's going to be in a much better situation. I don't have that flexibility. So again, I let the environment kind of dictate how it is and then I'll try to adapt to it. Yeah. We talk about that a lot in uh, some of our other Home of Olympus sec sessions as you plan, you plan ahead as much as you possibly can, but then you also have to have a backup plan for something else you want to shoot that night in case your plan doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. I've had many a plan go south on me, so I can mm -hmm. totally relate to that. Yep. When all else fails, I'm like, oh, look, we're doing star trails tonight. Yay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, can always make, you can always make that work. Uh, a lot of questions about the star trackers, but we did go over that. Um, and then somebody asked if you can use the 12 to 40 f2.8 pro lens for Astro. And I've actually used it for some night sky stuff at the, the 12 millimeter have you ever used that lens? So absolutely. And again, what I'm sharing with you is the ideal scenarios for me. I have the 12 to 40 and I have the 7 to 14. And again, for my style, I like wide. So I'm going to pick that. They're both extremely capable lenses and they're both an f2.8. And there may be times that you don't want as much wide or width. It. Then that 12 to 40 is going to be ideal for that. Uh, I've used it many times for uh, astrophotography and it's done a great job for me. But if I want more in the image, unless I start uh, you know, doing some panos, then you know I'm limited relative to that. And you may recall the other lens that I mentioned is the 12 millimeter, the, uh, the, the 2.0. And again, that's another brilliant one, which is the same, but I've also got two more stops of light with it. So uh, again, that's always part of the equation, but the 12 to, the 12 to 40 is 
very, very capable. It's just not as wide as I typically like them for, for astrophotography. Yeah. All right. I'm going to throw one more at you and then we'll, uh, get to the comment section in a little bit tonight. We gotta be uh, conscious of Frank's time. <laughs> He's out on the East Coast. <laughs> uh, do you use, for your Asari Sky AF, do you use accuracy or speed? Well, good question. I probably should have mentioned that. I use accuracy because if I'm doing astrophotography, I'm on a tripod. And yep. speed is meant to be handheld, uh, but the results, from the accuracy setting are just so much better. And, you know, again, given the choice of, uh, of handheld versus a tripod for astrophotography, I'll, I'll do that all day long. And, uh, you know, you're, if you're, you're not going to handheld, hold it for 20 seconds and get any kind of reasonable results, no matter how hard you tried. And you know, particularly if you had a couple of too, too many cups of coffee, it'll even compound it more, but, uh, yeah, accuracy is the answer for that with a tripod. Awesome. All right, everybody. I think we'll let Frank go for the evening. I do want to say thank you again for spending your Thursday evening with us. I heard there was a little hiccup on the Facebook side tonight. So all of you guys that came back, we appreciate that. It sounds like all of Facebook went down for a, a quick minute. <laughs> but thank you for sticking it out and hanging out with us tonight. And uh, as Frank has mentioned multiple times, we're super jazzed up. So April 22nd, we're going to follow up with another Home with Olympus uh, live Thursday night. Uh, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern, and Peter Baumgarten will be sharing with us some more advanced Starry Sky techniques and some post-processing and editing um, techniques that he uses is in, in his workflow. So it's going to be a really good night, um, continuing on with Astro April. In the meantime, April 11th, get out there, go shoot. So next week, or in two weeks when we're back, you can share some of your photos with us, all right? So get out there and thank you so much for spending your night with us. And thank you, Frank. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody. It was a real pleasure. Thanks for letting me spend some time and thank you, Olympus. I greatly appreciate it. Have a great night, everybody. Mm -hmm.